Good evening and uh, welcome to St. Vincent on behalf of Brother Norman Hips, the president of the college and the entire St. Vincent College community. I extend a warm welcome to our speaker, David Shedlowski, one of the leading sports journalists in the nation, particularly in the world of golf. So welcome, David, to St. Vincent. This is also a very special evening because today we're able to welcome some of those who worked with uh, Arnie very closely over the years, uh, his assistant, uh, Doc Giffen, and Gina Verone, who is his personal secretary over many years, and we're grateful for their presence. And uh, they'll, they'll be filled with questions, I'm sure, for, for David, or they'll be able to add to the stories that he has to tell us. But to uh, Doc, to Bunny, to Gina, to all of the family and friends of uh, the Palmer, so over the years, uh, uh, his niece is here too, uh, Cheryl. Where are you, Cheryl? She's here somewhere, hiding. The, uh, anyhow, uh, welcome to, to all of you who are, uh, who are here this evening with us. The, um, we've come together this evening uh, at the Fred Rogers Center to honor the legacy of another good neighbor and friend, Arnold Palmer. For us at St. Vincent, an important family aspect of that legacy is the Winnie Palmer Nature Reserve here on campus where thousands of young students are helped to understand how we must care for a beautiful creation God has given to all of us. And uh, it was Arnie's desire to create the Winnie Palmer Nature Reserve upon her passing, and it's been one of the lasting and memorial tributes to his wife, uh, Winnie, over these many years, and we're grateful that it's located on the St. Vincent campus. Amy Palmer sends her regrets that she is unable to be with us this evening to present our speaker because of a commitment at Bay Hill in Florida. Amy w said it was important for her to be a part of this event at St. Vincent and Latrobe to honor her mom and her dad, and she sent the following note, which I will read. Hello, everyone. Welcome to St. Vincent. I'm Amy, Amy Palmer Sanders. My mom and dad of blessed and happy memory were Winnie and Arnie Palmer. Although I'm obliged to be at Bay Hill this evening to fulfill a long-standing commitment, with my heart and soul I am present here with you this evening at St. Vincent to honor my dad's memory. My deepest gratitude to you, David, for helping my dad tell some of his stories of his wonderful life. Let me paraf paraphrase Jack Nicholas's comments on the book you co-authored with my dad, Arnold Palmer, A Life Well Lived to express the purpose of our special event at St. Vincent this evening. David Shedlowski's, Shedlowski's talk is a chance for all of us to embrace my dad, Arnold Palmer, one more time. So relax, sit back, and enjoy the evening, and may the good Lord bless us and help us to live a life that is also well played. As Jim Nance observed at Arnold Palmer's memorial service in 2016, in the Arch Abbey Basilica, all of us had a connection with Arnie Palmer. Most of us in this basilica had a friendship, but so many other people around the world never met him, but Arnie was their friend. As Arch Abbot of St. Vincent, I'm pleased to join Amy in welcoming David Shedlowski to St. Vincent and to Arnie's hometown, to La Trobe. To begin our evening this evening, we are pleased to share with you a short video tribute to Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer developed his style on his home course, where his father Deacon was the head professional and greenskeeper. He attended Wake Forest University on a golf scholarship, but briefly gave up the game his senior year to enlist in the U.S. Coast Guard, where he served three years. Upon returning, he picked up the game right where he left off and won the 1954 United States Amateur. He decided to give professional golf a try and won his first PGA Tour title his rookie year at the 1955 Canadian Open. Between his first PGA Tour victory at the age of 25 and his last win in 1973 at the age of 43, Palmer collected 62 PGA Tour titles and seven majors. How will you 
guys choose to remember Arnold Palmer? Continuing to, to play the game that we love, um, to try and live like he did, mm. to um, try and make a difference in the, in the golf world and outside of that as well. Palmer's true legacy was the impact he had on the lives of others. And no other person in the history of professional sports left as indelible a mark. In the 1980s, he established the Arnold Palmer Hospital for Children and Women, and subsequently, the Arnold Palmer Medical Center in Orlando. But he didn't stop there. Palmer built centers for cancer treatment in California and in his hometown of Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Arnold Palmer was one of those rare athletes, one of those rare human beings, who come along once in a lifetime. He's remembered and, and known not just in the U.S., but worldwide and even more so away from the golf course. It's beautifully spoken. Bubba? He was a pioneer for the game of golf. He, he paved the way for all of us to grow the game even more. He gave us the life lessons. He, he told us what we need to do. He showed us what we need to do. He became only the sixth athlete to receive the Congressional Gold Medal. I hope that I can thank you properly and tell you how much it means to me to be here to accept this award. I am very humbled. Thank you very much. And now we have to take it and run with it. And these young guys have to do that. He was proud of, of you guys and your generation. We can safely say the Ryder Cup is in good hands right now. And the game of golf is in very good hands. Guys, thank you for stopping by. Congratulations again on a phenomenal performance and winning the Ryder Cup. Those lucky enough to have witnessed his greatness will speak to his graciousness and a legacy that will inspire for generations to come. Arnold Palmer. A trailblazer, a philanthropist, a king. My memories of him as a grandfather, our family's memories, are here in Latrobe. Whether it was our summers here or the times we were here for Christmas. And it wasn't watching him win golf tournaments. It was watching him sled ride down the hills with us. You all are used to seeing him in his stiff collared shirts with the umbrella pin, wearing it with a style that only he could. <laughs> we had the unique opportunity to see him in cut off sweatpants and a t-shirt sometimes. And we loved that man as much as you loved the man that you saw on TV. All of us had a connection. Most of us in this basilica had a friendship, but so many other people around the world never met him, but Arnie was their friend. Whose idea was it I got to follow Jim Nance and Vince Gill and Sam Saunders? I mean, there's quite a lineup there, but uh, you know, I'm uh, extremely honored to be here and, uh, and touched. And um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, just very grateful to renew friendships with people like Doc Giffen and Bunny. It's a pleasure seeing you and Gina. Lovely seeing you. Um, Matt and John, um, great seeing you tonight. Um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful place, Latrobe, and I've been here many, many times to see Arnold, and um, I, I hope you don't take it the wrong way that it's a little emptier when he's not here, and yet he does feel like he's here, and um, I feel that with all of you here. Um, 
Before I begin, uh, thank you, Arch Abbott Douglas, for having me here. And I want to thank uh, Jim Berger for all your help. You've been very, very kind and helpful and patient. And Suzanne English, uh, wherever you are. Um, there she is. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, well, uh, we're going to talk about Arnold Palmer. Um, and do we ever get tired of hearing about Arnold Palmer? Um, I certainly never get tired talking about him. Uh, let me start, though, by talking about uh, who, who saw this year's Masters. Pretty cool. Tiger Woods, right? Cool story, right? Um, I was there, and uh, yeah, it was pretty neat. And then, uh, and, the, and, and then it kind of got spoiled because social media today does a lot of things that, you know, are sometimes not very good. And uh, one, uh, one gentleman wrote, hey, Tiger won his 15th major. Who in the world is more influential in golf than Tiger Woods? I have to sit back for a minute and think about that. How about Arnold Palmer? Yeah, exactly. We, we tend to forget because, you know, it's the here and now and it's the latest is the greatest and everything else, but really? I mean, Tiger Woods is an important golfer and a very good golfer, but more influential than Arnold Palmer. Anyway, let me share this with you. This is about Tiger Woods and Arnold Palmer. And this happened uh, in 1997 the week before Tiger won his Masters by 12 shots. And people may or may not remember that Tiger shot 59 at Isleworth Country Club, which, by the way, was designed by Arnold Palmer. That happened the week before Tiger won his Masters. But what people didn't know was that the day before he shot that 59, Tiger was locked in a very, very difficult battle with a 67-year-old man that he couldn't close out. And that was the, one of the essences of Arnold Palmer, was that Tiger, 21, just growing into the height of his skills and his game, couldn't beat a 67-year-old man. Now, it wasn't any 67-year-old man. It was Arnold Palmer. And of course, eventually, the age difference and so forth did take its toll, and Tiger closed him out on the 17th hole. But Arnold being Arnold, no, 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 no. You got in my pocket for $100, double or nothing, kid. Last hole, let's go. And uh, that's one of the great stories in the book, A Life Well Played. And of course, Tiger notices going down that 18th hole as Arnold has to pull driver on the second shot, just as he did in 2004, his last go around playing in his own event, the Bay Hill Invitational, now of course called the Arnold Palmer Invitational. The Tiger notices how much Arnold is grinding on this last hole. Driver off the tee, driver again from the fairway into the back bunker. Tiger's on the green in two. He's going to win another 100 from Arnold. Arnold got up and down for par. Tiger missed. They shook hands. Pretty good. That was Arnold Palmer, competitor to the end. I don't want to be too... I don't know, serious about Arnold because, um, because there were a lot of fun things about Arnold. Um, one of the things that people have asked me is, uh, how did you get the chance to write this book? And I said, well, part of it's luck, I guess, but I received a phone call from Alistair Johnston, and uh, he said, hey, um, we want to do one more book. Arnold wants, wants to write one more book, and, and he wants you to do it. And uh, we have a long list, but you're first on the list. And I said, you're going to have to throw the list out because you're not going to need to call anybody else. Uh, didn't matter what I, we didn't even talk about well, what it pay or what, who cares? It's Arnold asking you. Arnold called me two days later, and he said, hey, thank you for doing this. Um, I'm very excited for it. You'll probably like me less after it's finished. <laughs> I said, no chance, not a chance. But um, uh, some people probably are curious, how do you write a book? And you could write a book about how to write a book. But uh, 
when you have a subject like Arnold Palmer, it's not very hard. And uh, um, you do a little research, you talk to him, you have people like Doc Giffen to help you. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a wonderful experience. And it's, uh, it's something that we all tend to, um, you know, at the end of it, you see this finished product. But the process itself was almost more rewarding than the finished product because you get to spend time with this person who, um, you know, treats you like, you know, um, maybe not a son, but a best friend and uh, just a, a wonderful way about him. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a story I like to tell, and Doc was there. Um, this was maybe, oh, the third or fourth day of a five-day stay I had here at La Trobe, just going through archives, talking to Arnold every day, hearing what he had to say about different subjects. We are having a pretty good time here and there. But, you know, Arnold's, what, 86 at the time or, or thereabouts. You know, um, memory was great, engaging as ever, funny to the last bit. So every day we'd go to lunch. And of course, Doc knows this. Lunch! He wouldn't just tell you, hey guys, we're going to lunch. It would be just, lunch! We're going to lunch. I guess it's time. He would just yell through the office, lunch. Okay, we're going to lunch. Great. Another lunch with Arnie. I was tied up for a couple of seconds, so I was the last one to come into the, the, the clubhouse at uh, La Trobe Country Club. Kit was there. I walked past Kit and said hello and sat down, kind of pass behind Arnold in the back. And uh, he goes to Kit. He goes, hey, that's the guy who's been grilling me for three days. Uh, what? And, he, and then he turns to her and he goes, you know, I don't know why I'm doing this. And it's like he's changed his mind in like 30 seconds. Like, what, what am I doing here? This guy's killing me. And Kit just says, well, because you still have something to say. You know this face. No words, just tight lip. Yeah, he still had stuff to say. And um, that was kind of experience. Um, you know, you really can't put in the words because you wake up in the morning, you know, what is Arnie going to say today? What's Arnie going to say? And it started slow some days. Some days he started a little faster. He'd always have his black coffee and, you know, he'd get going. And uh, he was always a little better after lunch. I'm not sure why. Any theories? Okay. <laughs> Maybe he was, you know, a little more loosened up, but excuse me. But he was engaging all the same, as you would imagine. Um, I want to share this from the book. This is one of my favorite stories, and again, Doc was there when this occurred. It's a chapter called The Interview. And um, a young man had uh, asked Arnold for an interview as a radio reporter. And uh, Arnold being Arnold says, yeah, I'll be happy to sit down with you. Just one on one. You wouldn't get that much today, I could tell you. Today's golfers are not going to do what Arnold Palmer did, which is sit down for 12 minutes and give this kid an interview. Didn't even know him, 12 minutes. Guess what? Forgot to turn on the recorder. <laughs> the poor kid's shaking. He realizes his mistake. And Arnold says, it's OK, son. Let's do it again. And he sat there and did that interview again. Um, Arnold writes, in my mind, I don't think that what I did was anything special. Um, Bobby Jones once said about being complimented for calling a penalty on himself, you might as well praise a man for robbing a bank, for not robbing a bank, I should say. In other words, Jones didn't think he should get credit for doing the right thing. And that was the way Arnold approached things. He didn't think he should get credit for doing something, but that was, didn't know the kid, never saw him before. Blew the interview, that's okay kid, let's do it again. That's Arnold Palmer. 
I think it came from a lot of different things. He talked so much about his father and the influence that, uh, that he had on Arnold's life. And I mean, his, his father was a taskmaster. His father was tough on him. He had expectations for Arnold that were not tied to golf as much as tied to what kind of person Arnold should be. I mean, his mom certainly had a lot to do with uh, who Arnold became because he, he sort of had her personality, the engaging part and so forth. But it was Deacon who, uh, who sort of kept Arnold in line. And uh, this is one of the, this is definitely another one of my favorite stories from the 1961 British Open. And uh, Arnold writes, my dad never stopped giving me guidance about how I should look at my life and career. And he talks about by 1961, he'd won a couple of masters, he'd won the US Open, and now in July of 61, he comes home with the Claret Jug. He's won the British Open. Following that British Open, he celebrates, as one would, and he spends time with the Duke and Duchess, he enjoys himself with many important people. He has had the time of his life. He comes back home, and uh, his father couldn't be more proud. And he expresses that. And then he says to Arnold, hey, why don't you put that Claire jug down? I need you to go mow the back nine. <laughs> and he did it. He went out and did it. But Arnold writes that that was the kind of thing that that was what his father brought to the equation. You may be a great golfer. You may do great things on the golf course. But what, what does it mean unless you understand where you come from and who you are as a person? doesn't matter what you accomplish, how much money you make, whatever. And that was just, that was part of that charm. And that's what he got from his father was being grounded, understanding. And of course, Latrobe, as you all know, was his home. He spent a lot of time at Bay Hill. He's got that tournament there. And uh, he's done great things in Orlando with the hospitals, which is, of course, another great thing about Arnold Palmer is what he has done, including the hospital here and so forth. But everything that he did in Orlando was of a piece of belonging here. Even though he gave a part of himself there, it was just a part of himself. It wasn't him. He was here. He was part of this community. He wanted to be here. And everybody who is from Latrobe or lives in Latrobe, I mean, that's a special gift that he gave to this community and still gives to this community because he's still a part of this community. Uh, and I think that there's so many little parts in this book that bear that out as well. Again, who is he? He's Latrobe. He's St. Vincent College. He's, you know, the, uh, he's, he's the golf course. He's the community. He's the Winnie Palmer Nature Preserve. And of course, Winnie had a, a huge influence on him and, and she had a huge influence on this community as well. And, uh, and sadly, we probably don't talk about Winnie enough, but, uh, but we all know that she was very special too, and um, she was perfect for Arnold because she was one more person who, you know, sort of kept him, not necessarily on the straight and narrow, but, but kept him thinking about other people because that's who she was too. And, um, uh, Anyway, getting back to the book. The book itself is um, a collection that was an idea instead of writing one more memoir, which, you know, he already had done that. We wanted something that talked more about the things that he learned because he lived a full life. Arnie was larger than life and he lived more of it than pretty much anybody else. And, um, you know, it was, it was probably a lot of fun to be Arnold Palmer, I can only imagine. But 
he learned a lot of things along the way. And that was one of the conversations we did have later in the week that I did spend with him here is like, look, I, you know, I want to be able to, you know, impart some kind of, you know, wisdom as it were, or advice or what have you. And I said, okay, let's go back through some things and tell me what you learned. Um, and that was a special time because then I learned a lot about things that I thought I knew and I didn't really understand. And, and he was, a, he was pretty wise, as you would imagine. A very wise man who wanted to just have one more thing to say to people. And uh, also say thank you to him, in a way. Um, because he, he really did appreciate other people. Um, I've been asked a couple times, and I'll share a couple of my favorite stories of Arnold that are, that are personal. And one is that about four or five years ago, uh, maybe a little longer, uh, I brought my brother here to Latrobe. My brother's a year older than I am. He loves golf. He loves, loved Arnold Palmer. He'd never met him. I said, come on, we're going to go play Oakmont, and then we're going to drive up. We're going to go to Latrobe. We're going to play Latrobe Country Club. Maybe we'll meet Arnold. You know, he's probably hanging around there still. It was the worst day for golf ever. Nobody was out on the golf course. Everybody was in the clubhouse. Guess what? Arnold's in the clubhouse, grumbling. He's got this red sweater on. I walk in. He sees me. Dave, hello. Hey, come on, sit down. He's grumbling. What are you grumbling about? My wife made me put on the sweater for the Christmas photo. Well, that's the reason to be grumbling, I guess. Have another drink. What do we do? But my brother comes and, and he says, who's this? I says, well, this is my brother, Chet. Well, Chet, come in and sit down right here. Hey, Jim, get up. <laughs> Chet, come here and sit. Now, he hasn't met my brother. This is the first time he's met my brother. I've been around, you know, 100 times or whatever. He sat there for 10 minutes and asked my brother, well, what do you do? You married? Do you have kids? You like golf? He asked my brother all these questions. Genuinely interested in my brother. I'm not even interested in my brother that much. <laughs> I think he's married. Yeah, he's got kids. Yeah, okay. And uh, and I was just fascinated by that. Uh, that here he is meeting a stranger. Okay, he's brother of somebody he does know. But to spend that kind of time just getting to know him and genuinely interested in the answers and asking follow-up questions so you know he's listening because, oh, you're a banker. Well, what do you think about this? And blah, 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 blah. And then Arnold says, hey, you want to get a photo? Dave, take a photo. Come here. Oh, yeah, okay. Dave, take a photo. Yeah, I'm happy to. Get a photo of Arnie and my brother. Wait a minute. I don't even have a photo with Arnie. <laughs> Arnie, Chet, get out. I'm I need a photo with Arnie. I still have that photo on my phone. That was Arnold Palmer. I had visited Arnold on another occasion. That was maybe, maybe the year before we started the book. And it was in the fall. And Kit comes in with these bags, you know, these grocery bags that you get at whatever store, these plastic bags full of corn, ears of corn, from his, from his farm. I didn't know he had a farm. You got a farm? Yes. Now, Kit lays these ears of corn on the desk, and they are marveling, the two of them, at these ears of corn. These are beautiful ears of corn. Look at these ears of corn. It's like, it's corn. <laughs> <laughs> but simple things thrilled this man. That was, it was charming. It was wonderful. The best part, you're going to take some corn home, right, Dave? <laughs> now, there's several thoughts that run through your head when Arnold Palmer says, you're going to take some corn home. One, of course, is how do I get him to sign the corn? <laughs> I can't peel it, so we've got to keep it in the stock. OK, that, we never did good. And then when you take it home, how do you eat it? It's Arnold Palmer's corn. <laughs> I mean, you want to still to just have people over. Look, I've got Arnold Palmer's corn. You're going to eat it? I, I guess. I mean, you just feel like 
maybe you should just put it in glass. I don't know. But again, that's Arnold Palmer. Dave, you're going to take some corn home. He wants to share it. He wants you to feel part of things, you know, and it just, you, oh, I took six tiers of corn home. Of course I took it. I ate it. <laughs> it was really good, too. I remember if I told him that. Anyway, that was always a, uh, just a, a real moment, you know, because, I mean, the guy was so ordinary. Being, you know, while being extraordinary. He was so normal. How do you stay normal? I asked him once. We went to an event together at uh, the very first father-son when they started up again, and he played with his grandson, Will. Arnold had to do a sort of a 30-minute walkthrough at the Pro-Am party. So he took myself and Scott Wellington the three of us went. Scott drove, and uh, Arnold does his walkthrough. Excuse me. Arnold does his walkthrough. He sees some pros, Curtis Strange, a good friend, some other professionals, Lee Torino. A lot of, of course, uh, of the amateurs want to shake his hand and so forth. And you know, Arnold kind of breezes through, and he doesn't quite make it in 30 minutes. It's probably closer to an hour, you know, and. Um, we're leaving, and there's two gentlemen who aren't really acting like gentlemen, and they're, they're being very oppressive in their request that Arnold sign some autographs. They've got their, their like photos and their backpacks and their professionals or whatever they are, collectors. And they hound him all the way through the hotel. And he, we've got, now we've got security with us, and we're, Scott and I are looking at each other like, you know, these guys aren't giving up. I don't know what's going to happen here. Get into the car. Scott gets in, ready to pull away. These guys are right up against the window. Arnold says, hold up. Rolls down the window. Give me what you got. He signs everything. Rolls the window back up. Scott and I, why did you do that? He's like, well, you know, that's just what I do. And I said, Arnold, have you ever gotten mad at anybody in all this time? Have you, you know, Ever? Fans? He goes, I've only been mad twice. And I go, twice? In like 50 years you've been mad twice? I'm thinking, God, I mean, some people might be mad twice in a day. Twice. And I said, um, what happened? He said, well, one guy was, just wouldn't leave me alone and I asked him to step outside. <laughs> I said, oh, really? Did he? He goes, oh, no, no, no. Who would you take in that? I said, what happened to the other one? He goes, I don't remember. <laughs> but, he, but he was mad twice. I think, a lot of patience. I met Arnold in 1993, Cincinnati, Ohio. Kings Island, they had a golf course there. Sorry, it was the Jack Nicholas Golf Center at the time. Sorry, S sorry, Arnold. It was, during the 4th of July weekend, and it was a hot weekend in Cincinnati. And uh, I met him that week for the first time. I needed him for a story I was working on. In fact, Doc, I think you set up that interview, which, of course, you probably set up two or three in your career. <laughs> Million. And uh, I got my five minutes with him, and he was terrific. And um, then uh, the Saturday, which was, I believe, the 4th of July, unbelievable crowds there to watch Arnold. I walked around with him for 18 holes and it's 90 degrees and I don't think he played badly, he didn't play great, but he was definitely not going to win the tournament after that was the second round. Okay. He signs his card, he goes to the car, there is a horde of people following him out to the car and this is, there's no security, this is just a parking lot at, you know, an amusement park golf course. It was the car, Arnold. Oh my gosh. He starts signing autographs. 90 minutes in 90 degree heat, he signs autographs. 90 minutes. Rabbit, who used to be Gary Player's longtime caddy, was there. He'd wade in, give Arnold a beer, wade back out. P 
people all over. He signed every single autograph, except for the one or two times when he said, Rabbit, bring me another beer. How do you do that? How do you do that? How do you have the patience to not be angry after a while? It's 90 degrees. It's all these people want this autograph. And he, he signed every single one of them, including a writer from Ohio. Sorry. I still have that notebook. It's in my trunk. But uh, I waited till the very end. And he signed it. Um, one last thing about Arnold, and that is um, the lesson that he taught me that I'm imparting to you, and that is about how you treat people. And some days I am not that great at it either. I just, you just have your days. How did Arnold Palmer never have those days? You know, you just kind of wonder. How do you never have that? It just comes from a lot of different things, but I think more than anything, I think you go back to that interview story and Arnold's thought as he helped that kid was you put yourself in the shoes of the other person. I think if we take anything away from the evening, you put yourself in the shoes of the other person. In other words, didn't, Arnold didn't care who he was or what he did. He cared about trying to understand all of us. And that was the gift of Arnold Palmer. Was he perfect? Of course not. I'm not trying to like lionize him here. But I am trying to tell you that he was special in ways that still resonate, not only in this room, but like Jim Nance said, people who never met him around the world loved him, felt like they knew him. And that was because he, he could connect. He could connect by understanding the other person, just like he tried to understand my brother. I'm still trying to find, figure that one out, but anyway. <laughs> But I'm trying now because Arnie taught me. So if we take anything else away from here, except of course a book, is, <laughs> yeah, take one with is that uh, we should all just kind of leave here just trying to think about somebody else. Don't have to do it all the time, just once. Do it once, you're that much closer to Arnie. He'd be happy about that. <laughs>